All right. Our next storyteller, I'm excited about this. And, and we should have had ushers with tissues at a show like this. We have to remember that for next time. We have ushers with tissues because these stories are, are wonderful. Um, our next storyteller is Scooter DeMar. Scooter is a lifelong resident of Gross Hill, Michigan, where he raised uh, his twin, his twin seven-year-old daughters, Stella and Ruby. I love those names. I wanted to name my daughter Zoe uh, Bessie. My mama's here, but nobody would let me. But, but they, Stella and Ruby, that's beautiful. Um, he's a sales manager of Pella Windows and Doors and president of the Gross Hill School Board. Uh, Scooter received a Bachelor's of Science in Sports Medicine from the University of Indianapolis, where he played on a tennis scholarship for the 17th ranked team in the country. That's a big deal. Scooter also became a USPTR certified tennis professional in 2002. A fan of sports of all, all kinds, uh, Scooter is a big fan of golf where he plays a few days a week at the Gross Hill Golf and Country Club. So if any any Gross Hill Golf and Country Club people, you probably see him out there. And he loves to be on the boat in the summer whenever we get some warm weather in this place, you know? So I want you guys to give it up for Scooter DeMar. Scooter DeMar. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate it. How am I supposed to top what Dave just did out there? there? There's just not possible. There's no way I can. So, well, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, it's fantastic to see this many people out in the crowd. And, you know, I, it's funny. I was sitting out there and, and standing out in the lobby and, and talking with some of you. And all of a sudden, I see all these eyes going to this one person out there. And I'm like, they're not looking at me. Who are they looking at? And then I see Roop Raj come in. How am I going to compete with Roop Raj? Seeing people getting this picture taken with him. But it was interesting. This was my first time meeting Roop. And we talked for a moment or two outside. And he said something to me, which has already stuck with me. And it's pretty impressive when you talk with someone for a brief moment and they can have an impact on you already. So what Roop said to me was how amazing it is that when somebody comes up on a stage, they can tell their story and be completely vulnerable. And that's what we're doing tonight. We are being totally vulnerable. We're putting ourselves out there for you and sharing our story. So what I want to do, I want to be vulnerable. Now, vulnerable and vulnerability comes in a lot of different forms. Some people are maybe going and speaking in front of other people. Maybe it's going on that first date, starting a new job, doing something that you're not comfortable with. My vulnerability comes from a totally different place. It comes from who I am. So excuse me, as I take my shirt off, keep your dollar bills in your purses. I promise, I do have clothes on underneath here. I really do. I think I do. I guess we'll find out in a second. But what's interesting is how what we share with somebody can have a lasting impact. So I started speaking about 21 years ago when I was in college at the University of Indianapolis. In fact, I had my first speaking engagement at my cousin's school at St. Luke Elementary in Indianapolis, Indiana. I had never spoken to anybody before, let alone a school. Let alone, why am I going to go speak to a bunch of kids? What am I going to speak about? My aunt was actually in charge of the school, and she asked me to come and talk about my life. Now, I never thought my life was that interesting. For those of you that are familiar with the area, I grew up in Gross Hill. I've been... 
it by a lot. No, I didn't lose you. So I've been there for about 40 years. Grew up on Gross Hill. It's a very sheltered island. What could I possibly have to share with a bunch of elementary students? Apparently, she thought there was something. So what I want to do tonight is tell you a story, but more so, I want you to take a walk through my shoes. And that's kind of my mantra, walk in my shoes. Everybody in this room has their own story. And it's really amazing to me how different events in our life we remember as we get older. Some of them shape who we are today. Some of them maybe led us down one path or the other. Some events we have no idea why we remember them, but they stick in our mind. For me, the first story I remember is when I was in first grade. And I was in gym class. Now, kind of like Dame, school was not my forte. I didn't go to school to learn to read. I didn't go to learn how to color or stay inside the lines. I went to go see my friends and play. And that's all I wanted to do. And gym class was my absolute favorite. Not only gym class, but kickball. Did anybody here ever play kickball when they were in gym? I'm sure we all did, right? So I want you to go back to your first grade self. And I can picture the inside of the gym. It was at Meridian Elementary on Gross Hill. Our gym teacher was Mr. Bender. And he was the tallest man you've ever seen. He had to have been at least nine feet tall. And keep in mind, I was probably about two feet tall in first grade. But he was tall, he was skinny, I can still see his black hair just waved back with his thick black, black mustache. And we were playing kickball. And all I wanted to do was be the hero one day. This was that day. I had the opportunity. We were playing the other team, and I knew that class was almost over, and we were tied. There were no outs, but time was running up. I had a couple people in front of me, and when it was my turn to come up and kick, the bases were loaded, and I remember Mr. Bender saying, last batter. Well, inside, I'm like, oh, crap. I don't think I said crap back then, but of course, I was a little bit nervous, but this was my chance. And I'll never forget, and it's funny how you have certain people and you can see exactly where they were standing. And you knew exactly what was going on at that minute. And I was ready for this ball. And I'm standing at home plate, and I was so excited to win the game. And I'm staring at big, tall, skinny Mr. Bender and his big, thick, black mustache. And I'm ready for him to roll the ball to me. And he rolls it. And I'm ready to kick it. And he pitches it outside. All right, Scooter, regroup, regroup. I stare him again. He rolls a second time, and it bounces and bounces. And I can't kick it. Come on, Mr. Bender. Class is almost over. Give me something here. You don't want the stare from a first grader. I get ready for the third pitch, and I see it coming. And it's just like you see on TV, where everything's in slow motion. And I go and I get ready to kick it, and I wind up, and my leg goes flying off. So what do you do? You're a first grader. You got all these kids there. What do you do in that situation? You hop to first base on one leg. You're safe. You score, and you're the hero for the rest of the day. It's one of those stories that you just have no idea why you remember that. But I can remember everything vividly about that. So as Shannon mentioned, my name is Scooter. It really is. I know it's kind of a silly name. Technically, I'm Frank DeMar III. 
but I've gone by scooter my entire life. In fact, only two people have ever called me Frank. One being my college tennis coach, and one being one of my teammates in college. And that's it. Scooter really fits my personality more. I like to have fun. I like to joke around. But where did the name Scooter come from? This was me. This was me when I was born. That's me on the right-hand side with Dr. Keith Schroeder out in Barrington, Illinois. You see, when I was born, right after I was born, the doctors took me away from my parents. And they said that I would never walk nor live a productive life. I have a condition that's called Nivergelt's mesomalic dysplasia. It is extremely rare. It is a form of dwarfism and it affects your lower limbs. So for me, my arms, essentially you have your ulna and your radius and that makes up your forearm. What I have, the very little bones that I have in my arms are minuscule, they're tied in a knot and that's what forms my elbows. On my legs, I don't have any ankles, I don't have any heels, I don't have a fibula in either leg, and my right foot was amputated when I was five years old. Now the ironic part about everything is, my mom didn't smoke, she didn't drink, and there was absolutely zero family background of this condition. It was literally one of those rare instances that was a random mutation of a gene. Doctors could never have seen it coming. And you're thinking back, this is almost 40 years ago. They never saw anything like this. The doctors reached out across the country and there was so little known about this condition, my parents just had to go with it. So they said, okay, we can either shelter him or let him live his life. And that's something that I'll never take for granted. My parents raised myself and my sister Kristen, who is two years older than I am, no different than anybody else. I've lived my life just like everybody else in this room has. Which takes me to the picture on the left. When I was six months old, I had cast put on both my arms and both my legs. I never learned how to crawl. Never crawled. So to get around, I literally sat on my backside and I would scoot around all over the place. Hence, that's the origin of the name Scooter right there. Obviously, the picture on the right, as I mentioned, that is when I had my foot amputated. And it's funny, when I look at these pictures, and I see the picture on the left, this is right before I had my amputation. I had a leg, I had a foot, but my right foot was drifting so badly to the right, it almost was straight sideways. That's when my parents took me to Chicago, or Barrington, and they asked Dr. Schroeder, what do we do? And he gave my parents two choices. They could either lock it into place and make it look quote unquote normal, but I would never have any use of it, or they could amputate it. I can't imagine what my parents went through with a decision like that. Can't even imagine it. They left the choice up to the doctor. He said, let's amputate it. That might have been the beginning of the drive that I have inside that I've carried with me to this day. To this day, I'm probably one of the most competitive people that you'll ever meet. I want to win at everything I do. Everything I do. Whether it's running to the store, uh, doing jump ropes, whatever it is, I want to win. And I've always told people that that's something you can't teach people. It's an innate ability that you have to do your best and want to win all the time. But this isn't really where I fully recognized who I was as a person. So I grew up doing every sport possible. I swam, I played tennis, I played golf, I played baseball, I played basketball. I did it all. And when I was eight years old, I had a tennis coach, and his name was John Shade. And it's funny because I see a couple of people out here in the audience tonight that actually played for John Shade also. And he taught me everything I knew about tennis. 
He took extra time with me, day in and day out, and I played tennis every single possible day. And that was my crutch. That was my escape. You know, growing up, like I mentioned, my parents never treated me any different. Gross Eel is such a unique, small place that the people of the island never treated me any different. So I grew up not knowing that I was different from everybody else. Now, when we would have swim meets or tennis matches, you know, in middle school or elementary school, I would have kids come up to me and ask me what was wrong or what happened to your leg. And my answer was always the same. I kicked him in the leg with my prosthetic and I ran away. That was it, every time. Every time I did that. That's what happened. But then I started playing tennis. And I started getting pretty good at it. And it's funny, but this is my crutch. This was my escape from reality. I could go on the tennis court, and I was so confident in my abilities that I could beat anybody else I played. It didn't matter who it was. I was going to beat you. Probably 95% of the people I played were bigger, stronger, faster, just plain better. But in my mind, I always knew I was going to beat them, every single time. I was fortunate enough to play varsity at Gross Hill for all four years. I played singles for all four years. In fact, when I graduated, I held the Gross Seal School record for the most career wins. I held that for 12 years. I also was the first player to ever go 28-0 in our conference. I won the conference title four years in a row. And it afforded me the ability to get a tennis scholarship to the University of Indianapolis. But what was ironic was my senior year, this happened. I had a very large article done in the Detroit Free Press. Some of you might know the name Mick McCabe. He is a very well-known prep sports writer in the state of Michigan for the Detroit Free Press. And this article he did on the left. Now keep in mind, I had lots of articles done throughout my whole life, hundreds. But this one rang a bell. This is the first time in my life it made me open my eyes. When you read the title and it says disability, Tennis player earns college scholarship on ability. I read that, and I said, who's disabled? It's not me. And then I started going places. And people were asking, hey, you're a scooter. I said, yeah. I said, we saw, we saw your article in the paper. Great. Joe Dumars, who was part of the Detroit Pistons back then, he saw it too. He asked me to be his guest of honor for the Joe Dumars Celebrity Tennis Classic. I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was pretty cool. So I went. And it benefited the Children's Hospital. And I got to meet Joe and hang out with Joe. And Anna Kurnikova was there and Sergei Fedorov. And it was one of the coolest experiences I've ever met. But then I became more cognizant and aware that I was different from everybody else. So going to college was my escape. I went to the University of Indianapolis. I didn't know anybody. But I knew I was going to get to play tennis on a very good team uh, that was ranked in the top 20 in the country. And I remember my first week of college, I went to the big mall there in Indianapolis. And I went with some buddies that I met that first week. And we were in the mall for maybe five minutes. And somebody came up and said, you're a scooter, right? I said, yeah. He said, I heard you're a pretty good tennis player. I said, thanks. Now I know that people from outside of Michigan have somehow seen my article or heard my name, which is where the paper on the right came out, the Indianapolis Star. That was a big article, or the big newspaper in Indianapolis. I agreed to do a piece on it. And when I look back at it now, one of the funniest things is the tagline at the top. I can still remember saying this. I could care less if I died today. I have achieved 99.9% .9 of the things I want to achieve. How arrogant was I back then that I really had no idea? No idea. But that's the way I was. Was I arrogant? Sure. When I stepped on that tennis court, I was arrogant. And that carried with me. And then as soon as this article went out, 
This is the second event that really changed my life. From this point forward, I knew now, without a shadow of a doubt, that I was different. And it was one of the hardest things to accept. That was my freshman year of college. From that moment on, I was embarrassed. Sometimes I was ashamed. I didn't blame anybody. And if you just met me, you would never think twice of it. I was the happiest person. I was friendly. I loved going out and having a good time. But as soon as I got home, I would always lock up. When I was in my dorm room, I didn't like to go out in the hallways. Walking to class was different. I knew people were looking at me. It could have been 100 degrees in the middle of the summer. And I was always wearing long sleeve shirts, long pants, covering my body up. I was too embarrassed to show myself off. I led my life that way for the next 14 years. 14 years. I still went out, but I was always cognizant from the moment I w woke up to the moment I went to bed, no matter where I went, that people were looking at me. Whether it is true or not, I don't know. But I was sad ashamed. And the interesting part is, when I was on Grow Seal, that was my safe haven. I could walk around that island. I grew up there. My dad grew up there. My grandparents grew up there. That was my safe place. That and this. And I was good to go. I'll tell you, it's not a fun life when you're living and you're constantly thinking about who's talking about you, who's looking at you, what you're going to look like when you go out. It's not fun. 14 years I had this life until the third event changed it. I found out that I was going to have a child. It wasn't how I was raised. I was raised that you get married, then you have children. It didn't happen for me. And the funny thing is, is my conditions never stopped me from anything. Never stopped me from dating growing up. Never stopped me from sports, friends, nothing. I was never picked on as a kid. I was very fortunate. But I found out I was going to have a child. And I'll never forget sitting in the ultrasound room, and I was with my daughter's mother, and they were doing the ultrasound. And she was putting the wand on her stomach, and then she turned the TV off. And she said, oh boy. I never knew much about my condition. I never asked my parents about it. I didn't want to know about it. I was who I was. And now the daughter's, my daughter's mother and I were thinking, what? What's wrong? And she turns the screen back on and she says, well, here's your baby. And then she moved it across to the other side and she goes, here's your other baby. I said, oh shit. <laughs> oh my God. And then I sat there and I stared at the screen and then I just started laughing. And everything was good. And I was so excited to be a dad. That's one thing I've always wanted to do more than anything is be a dad. And then about eight weeks later, we had another ultrasound. Here's the next event. We were doing the ultrasound and it came back and we found out that one of my daughters was going to have my condition. There's a 50% chance every time I had children that would pass on, one of my daughters would, one of my daughters wouldn't. I've never been so broken down as I was that day. I remember driving home from the hospital, crying my eyes out the entire way. And finally, the girl's mother just looked at me and said, I'm not mad at you. It's okay. And I'll never forget that. So at that point, I had to make a decision. I could either continue to hide myself away and be ashamed, or I could live for my girls. But what kind of role model would I be if I was hiding myself away? And I dedicated to myself that day that I was going to wear a short sleeve shirt and shorts. And it might sound silly to most of you. It was terrifying to me. It was terrifying. But I did it. And every day that went by, I slowly did it more and more. And then I'd venture off the island. Because remember, I could do this on the island, and I was fine. But as soon as I went anywhere else, it was nerve-wracking. 
and I force myself to get out there and push myself out there. So when my daughters were born, they were born 10 weeks early. They weighed two and three pounds at birth. They suffered a stroke when they were in utero. They were both diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Very fortunate that it's a mild case of cerebral palsy. It didn't affect them cognitively, but it did affect them walking. My one daughter, Ruby, she didn't walk for the first time until she was two and a half years old. She had a walker. Stella, who has my condition, she didn't walk for three and a half years old until she was three and a half. And I'm going to tell you why she started walking. I want you to think about living three and a half years of your life, the first three and a half years of your life, living on your stomach, looking up at everything. It's a big world when you're looking up from your stomach. The girl's mother and I went to U of M hospital, and the day that I always knew was probably coming, just kind of always dreaded, was finally here. And it was in January of 2015. Stell had undergone numerous surgeries, just like I had. Trying to correct her feet, her feet were pointed straight down like a ballerina. The soles of her feet were pointed inwards. We finally got him to a somewhat normal looking position, but she still couldn't stand up or bear weight. So that January of 2015, the surgeon said, it's time to amputate her feet. Three and a half years old. How do you amputate a kid's feet at three and a half years old? I had mine done when I was five. That was just one. So I can't even imagine what my parents went through after what I went through. You would think I'd be prepared for it. Nothing can prepare you for something like that. Nothing at all. I'll tell you what. It was the best decision that has ever been made. Stella had her amputation. Thank God, the gentleman who does my prosthetics to this day is still in practice. I went right to him. His name is Jeff Ropp, Ropp Orthopedic. He is absolutely phenomenal. He stepped right in and said, I'm going to take care of Stella. Don't worry about it. Stella's legs had to heal for eight weeks. We went. He casted her legs over the course of about four or five visits. The very first time, she put her test sockets on. It's funny, it was just on my Facebook feed, uh, my memory section the other day. She grabbed a handlebar, put her prosthetics on, stood right up and danced. For the first time ever, never once, stood in three and a half years, and now she did. Today, my girls do everything you could possibly think of. They do everything that I did. I'm actually here missing their first softball game tonight. They're in softball. They're in junior golf. They're in swimming. They're in tennis. They're in everything. These are my girls. This was our daddy-daughter dance. Thank you. This uh, picture on the right-hand side is our daddy-daughter dance that we did this past year. But the picture on the left is probably my favorite picture out of any picture I ever had. And this was taken at the hospital at U of M right after Stella had surgery. And she came too. And she has got my fighting spirit inside her. And she wanted to take a picture and put it out so everybody could see. Because we call them magical feet. And that's how I prepped her for her surgery. We said, you're going to have two magic feet now, Stella. And she wanted the whole world to know that she's got two magic feet and daddy's only got one. So she wins. <laughs> she got me on that one. So I want to leave you with a thought. When I found out that Stella was having surgery, the amount of emails and texts and phone calls that I received were unbelievable. Unbelievable. The amount of support from the community, from people all across the country was unbelievable. And the reoccurring theme, and I never even thought about it until tonight. So many people said, kids are, what do you think? Resilient. Kids are resilient. And I agree that I'm going to challenge you with something. Aren't adults? We're resilient too, aren't we? It all lies right here between your ears. Thank you, everybody, for your time tonight.